Today, we're talking about Islamic art and Dutch artist MC Escher, who was not Muslim but found Islamic art super inspiring. By the way, did you know he was left-handed as well? More on him in a minute. Support provided by the Glick Fund, a CICF fund focused on inspiring philanthropy. Additional support provided by the Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation in honor of the children and families of Crystal House. Islamic art dates back to the 7th century and continues today. It's used both in holy places in the Middle East, such as a mosque, but has influenced designs used all over the world in architecture, fashion, and probably even in your kitchen. When used in religious spaces, Islamic art does not represent figures, as this is seen as idolatry, but instead uses shapes and calligraphy repeated in patterns over and over again. Did you know this form of writing is the third most widely used in the world? It's also written from right to left, something we are definitely not used to. Many Islamic designs are arranged in beautiful mathematic patterns called tessellations, which are hand carved in this amazing window. And check out these graceful interlacing curved lines that look like vines, which are actually called arabesque. One of the most beautiful surviving examples of this art form is the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. This huge complex was built in the 13th and 14th centuries and was used as a palace when the region was ruled by an Islamic or Moorish kingdom. Artists spent years carving these intricate designs out of wood, stone, and plaster. Everything is done by hand, something I always respect about Islamic art and architecture. Many of these designs were once brightly whitewashed, but over the centuries, most of the paint has worn away. When M.C. Escher first visited in 1922, he was amazed by all the tessellating patterns. In the Alhambra, all 17 possible plain symmetry patterns are represented, demonstrating how advanced the Moorish kingdom was at this time. An inspired M.C. Escher returned in 1936 making sketches of the tiles and continued to use the idea of tessellation and repeating patterns throughout his work. He said about tessellation, it remains an extremely absorbing activity, a real mania to which I have become addicted and from which I sometimes find it hard to tear myself away. Guess it's a good thing his high school art teacher convinced him to be a graphic artist rather than an architect. Worlds away from his native Netherlands, Escher found inspiration in a foreign and beautiful art form, something Escher and I have in common, a love for other cultures. Now let's take our own trip around the world without leaving the Midwest. We're going to check in with the Cincinnati Art Museum to see a room that has traveled hundreds of years and thousands of miles from Damascus, Syria. Let's check it out. We're here in Ohio at the beautiful Cincinnati Art Museum, where we're gonna get a behind the scenes look at some of the museum's most prized pieces from around the world. Let's get inside and take a look. Follow me. We are here in a very dark room with one of the curators, Cynthia Amneus who is gonna tell us a little bit more about the room. Thank you so much for joining us, Absolutely. by the way. And I have to ask, of course, as I just mentioned, why is it very dimly lit in here? Well, first of all, this is how you would have seen the room if you lived in the house where this room was originally. It would have been dim. But also, the materials and the paints in this room are light sensitive. So as a museum, we need to care for our objects uh, so that they're preserved for future generations and we need to keep the light low. Where is this from, and then how in the world did it get in here, in the museum, in its, in its hole here? <laughs> right. So this room is from Damascus. We call it the Damascus Room. And it was purchased by Andrew Jurgens in the 1930s on his travels to the Middle East. And he brought it back and installed it in his home in a Cincinnati neighborhood, and then it was donated to the museum years later. So what originally was the purpose of this room? 
This was originally an, a, a kind of a parlor room in a wealthy person's home in Damascus. So it's very ornate, as you can see, the painting on the walls and the gilding. The designs are typical of Islamic uh, style in the period, in the 18th century. They combine floral and geometric motifs, but there's also a European influence, kind of Baroque uh, European influence. So you see lots of arabesques and scrolling uh, types of motifs. Is this something typical, like that they would cover everything or every piece of art with that much detail? You see that in ceramics and textiles, absolutely, this kind of convergence of lots of geometry and lots of floral and vegetal motifs. The ceiling in here is, each design is called a coffer, and it is designed with a specific repeat in mind, so you'll see repeated designs across the, the surface of the ceiling. What makes this so unique to the museum? Well, it's one of very few rooms like this from this period anywhere in the world that still exists. Uh, there's another piece similar to it in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, but this, this is a very rare room to have intact with all of this uh, decoration. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia, for uh, showing us this room, which is fantastic to get into to stand in this space and learn a little bit more from you. So glad you were here. The calligraphy in the Damascus room has left me inspired. I have an idea for a project that I want to show you. Follow me. For this project, I want to use both repeated floral inspired patterns and calligraphy. Two hallmarks of Islamic art we saw in the Damascus room. Let's check out the supplies. First thing we need is a canvas. Next, we need some paint. I'm using simple watercolor paint, but you can use whatever you like. We also need some brushes, water, and a towel. I also have paint and permanent markers. Most importantly, we need an idea. I printed off this pattern to work from and this Islamic calligraphy text, which means creativity. I also love this design I found online. Pretty cool, right? Let's get started. Remember, symmetry in Islamic art is incredibly important. The more often you can use a ruler to help keep that symmetry, the better. Quick tip, this type of watercolor paint only requires a tiny bit of paint and an incredible amount of water. I'm really experimenting with the application of watercolor paint here. Sometimes I use a lot of water and less paint, and then I switch it up. After the paint dried, I'm going back over my design with my pencil so I can better apply the marker and paint. I definitely do not have a black belt in making a straight line, hence why you see me use a ruler. Next up, I'm sketching out the calligraphy text I printed off. Having a couple different brush sizes would be awesome. Also remember to use the tip of your brush when you're doing those fine lines. I'm going to stop there for now, but I hope this left you with some ideas of what you could do with Islamic calligraphy and designs. I was really excited to do this. I'm going to keep working, but you get started. Until later, stay outrageous. We're here in Indy to meet an incredibly multi-talented artist named Dan Thompson. Dan is known across the U.S. not just for his amazing skill as a graffiti artist, but also for his mural work and illustration. I can't wait for you to meet him. Let's get inside. The spray can is available to everyone, probably in your house. I think the thing about spray paint is it's the easiest, in a way it's the easiest thing to do. It's the closest thing to drawing. If you want to do it, you just do it. <laughs> 